given the subject of the panel doing lakes asia um on asia seems logical uh it's the first time in a long time had gone back to those uh you know to the continental prophecies um you know I, I tend to go for the long ones or the short ones or whatever but what struck me um was how little reference to asia commentary on asia makes uh david worrell said yesterday that the tate edition was you know 20 years old and uh you know life moves on but it, it's very striking that there are no uh annotations to asia on the asia plates of asia there is one in the africa plate of asia where rintra hands over abstract philosophy to brahma in the east so just to make a link to may's paper that we can read uh, Blake as in the context of enlightenment mythography uh, the most respectable exponent of that is William Jones although he cites Bryant uh, emphatically in the descriptive catalogue so uh, if we take that there's a poetic as Professor Zuki said there's a poetic genius which is originary and then there are these different religious traditions that all have something in common so we could uh, by that con uh, in that context we can read Nezu and Orc as part of some common uh, mythopoeic uh, grid or, or whatever but again in terms of the colonial context, the kind of imperial history, um, the kind of uh, comparative mythology, the Asiatic Society, William Jones, Wilkins' translation of Bhagavad Gita are explicitly sponsored by the East India Company and uh, Warren Hastings, the Governor General of India, writes a preface to uh wilkins bugger the beta log so so in terms of it, we can go back to some kind of syncretic religion where there is some sort of prior principle which is relativistic and inclusive or we can read it very specifically as a state-sponsored project uh about colonial knowledge and again, if we go to you know McLeese, the most obvious example, but also many others, uh, the idea that Blake is somehow miraculously outside um, those structures, uh, usually it is um, uh, you know, Blake at Felpham, uh, which is seen as a patronage relationship. But his uh, most reliable source of income over many years was Thomas Bucks, who bought a lot of his religious paintings. So if he needed, you know, bailing out, he did do a few things. But yeah, over a number of years, the most important source of patronage, uh, Thomas Butts ran the Office of Musters, which is basically procurement uh, for the army and it, it got uh, Blake's brother James a job. But the idea that Blake is somehow completely outside and exempt um, doesn't hold up to very close inspection. Uh, also the idea, uh, yeah, there's, there's an enlightenment Blake, which perhaps with unexpectedly, we can see him as uh, familiar with the work of Jones, taking on comparative mythology uh is it already uh by 1795 that's out of date or whatever so wilkins translation of the bhagavad gita is 1785 the next year uh hastings who has paid for that is summoned back and he goes on trial for seven years um or whatever Cornwallis comes in 
and we get instead of uh, this uh, older generation of British Orientalists who are partially, if not entirely, corrupt, but also interested in Indian traditions, uh, are out and a new thing. But still, so we, we can read a mythopoeic Blake who is slightly past his sell by date in 1795, The Song of Loss. Or and in 1809 with descriptive catalog, um, even more so. And Jacob Bryant was probably always out of date. But so, um, why is there no reference to Asia in annotations to Asia? And so we have, who are the kings of Asia? As a rather specific point in the descriptive catalog. Blake talks about ancient republics, monarchies, and patriarchs of Asia as the political structures, not kings. Uh, monarch, if you look it up, is the kind of single ruler of a state, but not um, involving ancestral succession. But if you think about the, you know, the um, Orientalism, negative despotism, uh, sultans, shoguns, emperors, uh, nawabs. Uh, we have lots of terms for Asian rulers, but not kings. So who are the kings of Asia referred to in the opening line of Asia? I would suggest they are the nawabs of the East Indian Company, uh, suddenly enriched after the victory of the British at Plassey, coming back, flooding kind of British society with new wealth. And again, if you read the commentary on it, um, there was uh, a harvest failure in 1794, 1795. Uh, bread prices rose, there were hoardings, uh, it was discussed in cabinet about whether they should release corn, um, taking a fairly kind of cruel um, attitude to it with Burke and Pitt. Uh, Malthus only comes up 1798, but the um, broad attitudes are, you know, if the poor are poor, it's because they don't work hard enough and they breed too much or whatever. And you know, generally the reading of the Song of Loss puts it in that 1790s context. Um, if you go back to the colonial context and the Bengal famine uh, of 1770, really kind of, it's, it's over a period of years. Um, so um, the, the, the figures vary but um, so again, it's, it's complicated. The, the East India Company have tax raising powers, which is called Tiwari, but they don't have direct administrative control, which is Nisima or, or whatever. Uh, and so when the kind of the harvests fail, the East India Company keep extracting tax revenues and don't intervene to release food although there's also arguments that this was to do with kind of local um, Indian politics. But what, what you have is, uh, on traditional estimates, seven to ten million people dying in Bengal in the early 1770s. Uh, more recent uh, estimates tend to be a bit lower, but there's still a uh, minimum three million. Um, if you read the scholarship on you know, pit repression, the mid 1790s, uh, there is hunger, uh, there is anger, um, there are riots, but there is not mass starvation on, on the scale of millions, or later on we get in Ireland. Uh, in fact, the, 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 the British context is uh, trivial compared to the scale of the Indian famine, which it goes completely unmentioned in the Blake scholarship. Um, 
So, so uh, you know, it's clear, I mean, as you say, nobody cared. You know, they're Indians. They breed too quick or whatever. Um, it was enough for Robert Clive to have to appear before Parliament in 1772, where he defended himself by saying he had been so moderate or whatever. But the, the, so what happens if we read Asia um, in an Asian context? Uh, usually it's taken as a displacement of commentary on mid-1790s um, state repression by Pitt, uh, for which there are some grounds. Uh, but it seems to me striking that um, you, know, no, you can't say no, sorry? You can't say nobody's starved in Britain, but you can't say that millions of people starved either. And this kind of occlusion of the Asian context is near total. So what happens in 1795? Uh, London Corresponding Society uh, gets formed. There's the treason trials. There's um, I would suggest, I and mean, we, we, we can have Thomas Spence or, or Payne or Richard Brothers. We can think of Blake um, in terms of a number of different you know, religious denominations, prophets. Um, I'd just like to suggest uh, William Carey and the missionary contest. So William Carey, a very similar background to Blake, artisan, polymath, self-taught, really impressive. So he teaches himself, um, you know, Greek and Latin when he's an apprentice shoemaker. Uh, he learns French and Italian and Hebrew. He goes to uh, India and uh, learns uh, Bengali to do the first translation of the Bible to do, uh, he learns Sanskrit, he, he does the first Malathi dictionary, he sets up the first printing house um, in India, uh, which ends up translating the Bible into 44 different languages. But in terms of, you know, who is parallel to Blake? You know, how can we read global Blake back um, into it? So what do we get with uh, at the beginning of summer loss, we get the division of four tables, which corresponds to Carey's division in his uh, inquiry into conversion of the heathen, 1792, into Europe and Asia and Africa and America, which is replicated in Blake's Jerusalem. So if we have the second plate. Uh, to go on. So um, this, this is the frontispiece. So this is the globe. We have global Blake. This is the dark globe. Uh, the commentary on it. So we read this as Eurism prostrate before his creation or whatever. Uh, we have the, the marks, this you know, peculiar um, it's different in every version, but it's sort of bespattled or, or whatever. So what is going on? So we have a figure who is worshipping uh, a globe, an empire that they have made, uh, weeping, worshipping, uh, very Eurozenic uh, or whatever. In the detailed commentary, uh, there's a book uh, on, there's an altar and there's a book uh, that Eurozone or whoever we want uh, is, is presiding over. But so, uh, the, what does it represent? The, the dark globe. Uh, so, you, if we see Eurozone in the context of Carey, the book is the Bible, it's the translations of the Bible the kind of the globe is getting the typography of the transmission into new languages. Oh, yeah. 
<coughs> so the dark globe. So uh, that, yeah, again, in the sort of seventeen ninety stuff, do we read uh, clear oppositions between Eurozone and loss? So we could just look at the last plate, if that's okay. So usually we it's seen as double that we have Eurozone, who's old and spidery and weaves a web, and this is loss or whatever. Uh, what we get is a sun, the sun beaten by loss, who is soul, if we want to invert it into a sun god. Loss, the song of loss is also the loss of eternity, and profit is a pun on profit. Uh, so uh, do we see Eurozone as smiling hypocrisy, uh, creating universal empire? Do we see Blake as uh, an Orkian figure of rebellion and defiance? Uh, both sons are equally occluded. Both figures are... Uh, Eurozen has made a world. Loss has made the world. They are the same world or whatever. The two figures conflate on each other. So just in terms, again, in McDesey's uh, thesis, which uh, has its strong points and its weak points, that, that Blake is outside the discourse of uh, Orientalism. Blake has the residual discourse of Enlightenment mythography, which we can read two ways. We can see it's a way of displacing Christianity, displacing Western civilization, or we can see it as sponsored by the East Indian Company. Or we say, if we think of uh, in terms of missionary discourse, we get a much more interesting relation between uh, not prophecy, not the bard. What's important in the 19th century are missionaries and their relation to empire state power, which is complex and uh, you know variable. Sometimes the missionaries want imperial intervention. You know, you wipe out the gods of the heathen so the Christians can, so can, can come in. Other times, the missionaries are the voice of protest about imperial power and cruelty. The relationship of laws and religion, which, again, in a lot of commentary, it's mind for manacles. Okay, what, if you're a missionary, what you do is transmit Christianity, Western religion, as a form of social control. If you can read through the discourse, of missionaries, which I think Blake is, you know, quite deeply affected by, and the best way of reading Loss, fighting his solitary battle in the time of renovation, waiting for a coming which is never quite there, is um, in the context of this sort of partially complicit, partially oppositional missionary discourse. I just say the kind of the emblem of the conference, uh, the forever destroying, creating, forever destroying, the angels presiding over the planet Earth, the globe, are, you know, if you put that in the missionary context of evangelicalism, they would be weeping for the lost souls. And then this. Uh, sense of individual mission never to be fulfilled is very powerfully there in missionary discourse through the thing. So, I mean, Jason's, you know, done excellent work on the bard, the 18th century prophecy or whatever. What happens to that? Um, it's out of date by 1795, certainly 1809, descriptive catalogue. But it goes forward into the later 19th century to present the contradictions of the imperial imaginary. So David Wallace said yesterday that the kind of 
you know, uh, it's to do with neuroscience that, you know, Blake is universal because he kind of logs into certain patterns which are hardwired into us. I, I'd make the kind of alternative claim that the kind of Blake both goes back to enlightenment traditions, which are potentially liberating, although often complicit, and forward to these sort of oppositional but constrained protests against empire that you know coexist with uh, you know the later expansion of Europe in the late 19th century. And I'll stop there because I think I'm over.